you've been a consumer of this channel's work for some time, you'll notice that ideas come from all over the place because the internet is a brilliant place. Sometimes it can just be something random that pops up that makes you go, ooh, that's interesting, or how did it get to this point? Places like Matt Bishop's Twitter page. He's always posting things like statistics, trivia, and all sorts, or it could just be something that started randomly as a discussion on Discord. You know the sort of thing I mean, when you're not actively looking for stuff but you end up talking about it anyway, and then it starts a discussion where you end up doing all those in-depth Google searches because you want to know the answers. At least, I do. Can't go to sleep without knowing because it'll keep me up all night. Yeah, I know, it's weird. And that's where the idea for this video started. Discord. It was just one of those throwaway conversations I had with somebody that ended up leading to me making this video. And it was all about the construction of gearboxes, for some unknown reason. When did they start using this material? When did they start using this material? Were they trying this? Were they trying that? And how it all led to the directions they went in, whether that's exotic materials or design or things like that. So yeah, strap in because this one's going to be a bit geekier than normal. So we go back to the beginning. Cars in pre-war Grand Prix racing were a far cry from the utterly insane bits of engineering that they are now. Tyres that had the contact patch of a 10 pence coin, 400 litre engines that could only produce 90 horsepower, and then it all evolved into the early years of the Formula One World Championship that began in 1950. Take this Maserati 250F for instance. This car originally shipped with a 4-speed gearbox made by Maserati, but then switched to a 5-speed made by Sternzi that would have allowed for a few extra advantages. For one, first gear wouldn't have to be so long, so better acceleration off the line, and better acceleration out of corners because downshifting would be a more optimal thing to do. These things were basic, cars and gearboxes, but they did the job. The technology just wasn't there. But as the sport began to evolve, so did the different ways that the engineers started trying to push that envelope. By the mid-1960s, most of the privateer entrance or garage Easter teams were running gearboxes made by Hewland. This is a name you might have heard me use a few times over the episodes of this series as I have referred to, on multiple occasions, the plucky privateer starter pack. Customer chassis, usually for March, a Cosworth DFV, and a Hewlin gearbox. With the advent of the Cosworth DFV coming in 1967 and then being opened up to all the teams in 1968 because Ford wanted a bigger market share of the Formula 1 grid, a Hewlin gearbox mated to a DFV was the combo to have. Whether that was by design, Cosworth wanted them mated up to those gearboxes, or that's what they had lying around when they did the prototypes, or that's what Lotus were using when they started testing the engine, I don't know. But you wouldn't put it past them for it to be all three of those things. By that time though, things had changed ever so slightly. Hewland, which had been formed in 1957, was building bespoke gearboxes that all the teams loved, and were coming as standard with five forward gears and one reverse. And, as far as I could tell, it was clutch up and clutch down with heel and toe to save on the gearbox, given how many times a Formula 1 car would change gear over the course of a Grand Prix. I did find a very brief onboard of Jim Clark going round Brand's hatch that came from 1964, and he definitely drops his left leg down to change up between Druids and Graham Hill Bend, but that's not to say he didn't do it at any other point on the track. But at the same time, there's no synchros on those boxes, so lift and slam TM is still possible if you know what you're doing, so it could just be driver preference. The actual information is quite hard to come by. And I discussed all this briefly on the video I did about Ferrari's first ever flappy paddle gearbox, so I'll keep it brief. On the way back down, the drivers would use heel and toe, rev matching, whatever you want to call it, to make sure that the engine didn't explode when dropping down a gear. It also meant that the car was going to be much more under control as it went down the box, as the torque being sent to the rear wheels as the engine peaked wouldn't spin the rears up. In the mid-1970s, Hewland's gearboxes were still being used up and down the grid, but Ferrari had another idea as they modified the 312 for the 1975 season. Mauro Forgieri was intent on keeping the weight of the Ferrari down and also keeping a decent centre of mass for handling, so during the 1974 season, Forgieri had worked on a transverse gearbox instead of a longitudinally mounted one. The mass was kept in one place and it also reduced yaw, as the mass on the 312 in 1975 was contained completely within the wheelbase. So you'd think then that everybody would have copied this pretty quickly, but it was only a quick copy from some of the teams before some began reverting. With the advent of ground effect which required narrower gearboxes, teams would go back to a longitudinally mounted gearbox to allow for the bigger Venturi tunnels, although it appears that Brabham was able to make a transverse gearbox small enough to allow for the Venturi tunnels to do their thing. Hewlin was still supplying gearboxes even at this time because the vast majority of the teams were still using DFEs, although that was going to change as they entered the turbo era. They were cheap, easy to maintain, reliable and, well, 
all the teams loved them. But when ground effect was banned at the end of 1982, they started to revert back to these longitudinally mounted gearboxes because of the way the design philosophy was changing. But Enrique Scalabroni, who was at Williams, and Dave Wass and Paul Crux at Benetton, managed to come up with the inboard transverse gearbox. Lightweight, compact, and could still do the job. These boxes also contained dog rings that would allow drivers to more efficiently do the lift and slam technique that I discussed before. They'd now be in a position where, if they needed to, could clutchlessly, that's not even a word but I'll still run with it, downshift, only using the right foot for rev matching. Or do what Senna did at Monaco where he would clutch and drop the thing down straight from 6 to 2nd. So by this point, the shifts were much faster than they had been previously. I'll leave a clip in the description to Alex Rossi driving a Lotus 49 at Cota as part of a demo run, where it might have been part of a race weekend, I can't remember, but he is definitely dropping his left leg to clutch up on the gear shifts and then heel and toe on the way down. There's also a clip of Senna from 1989, I think it is, at Suzuka, where he's changing gears so fast just by lifting and slamming, he might as well have had a flappy paddle gearbox. Speaking of, John Barnard at Ferrari around that same time had designed a revolutionary flappy paddle gearbox. I've covered this in detail in its own video so I won't go into too much detail again because it will be stuff you've already heard before. Uh, well, assuming you've already watched that video anyway. At this same time, transverse gearboxes were still popular but were about to fall out of favour due to changes in car design and the changes that the FIA was going to make in response to the events of Imola 1994. Because the cars ended up being narrower at the rear and had this coke bottle type rear construction, having narrower, smaller gearboxes was going to be key. Things were going back to a longitudinal design, but the goal now was lighter, smaller gearboxes that were able to handle the abuse needed over the course of a Grand Prix weekend. By 1995, everybody except the 40 team was on a flappy paddle sequential, and in 1996, the days of H pattern were over. But as just mentioned, a new arms race was beginning. And this is where things do get interesting because in the 1990s teams had already begun designing their own in-house bespoke gearboxes specific for their engines and cars. And for the most part they were made out of cast magnesium due to it being lighter than aluminium and having other properties that the teams needed. But who was the first to get a full-on die-cast titanium gearbox casing made? McLaren? No. Williams? No. Ferrari? No. It was Minardi of all people. Yes, the die-cast titanium case was first used by everybody's favourite minnows in 2000. Now, Ferrari had fabricated one in 1997, but it was astronomically expensive for what it was, as it needed to be welded together in sterile conditions. It was structurally strong, light, and made its debut at the Spanish Grand Prix that year. While before this, attempts had been made using other materials. Again, it was one of the minnows that tried this. John Barnard, who was now at Arrows, had come up with a carbon fibre gearbox casing in 1998. It wasn't particularly reliable, but Barnard believed that once the initial kinks had been ironed out, then it might be something all the teams would be getting on board with. But Barnard himself had never liked the magnesium casings, which, due to the technology of the time, meant that the thickness wasn't exactly uniform, and magnesium begins to reduce in stiffness above 100 degrees Celsius. Titanium was the most logical direction to take this construction in, but this also had its problems as Ferrari had already found out. Welding it together and doing it in those kind of conditions was really expensive, and die casting it still was a bit expensive and it took longer to do, but at the end of it all, you had a 40% weight saving. So when Barnard joined Arrows, it was him and Alan Jenkins at Stewart that were looking into employing carbon fibre in the construction of the gearbox casings. Stewart had a very hard time getting theirs to work properly, and although both Stewart and Barnard could get a working example down to around 14 kilos, when Stewart rebranded to Jaguar, they abandoned carbon and went back to the safety of magnesium. But the thing is, we're now in the early 2000s. The mass involvement of manufacturers was going to drive up the costs and the arms race incredibly high, and any advantage the teams could get was going to be huge. Teams now had gearboxes capable of fully automated upshifting, and also had electronic lift and blip systems installed to make sure that the whole thing was as fast as possible. And flappy paddle gearboxes, as much as people don't like them, were here to stay. In 2003, Renault arrived with what is now pretty much the standard for gearbox construction. They were using a titanium lower section of the gearbox and a carbon fibre upper structure that worked okay, but they were back on a fully titanium model for 2004 and beyond. Today, this is pretty much the construction model. They make the structural bulkheads of the box out of titanium, the rest out of carbon to keep it light, structurally strong, and also deal with any heat dissipation, which carbon fibre is pretty bad at. Going through 2004 and 2005, McLaren and Honda were rumoured to be working on a gearbox that seamlessly shifted between 
whatever gear you were in and the next gear. But they were sort of ooing and ahhing about running it because of the bans on things like continuously variable transmissions or CVT boxes that Williams had trialled in 1993 but never got to run it because, well, the FIA saw what they were doing and said, lol, no. So things were now going in another direction and this is where Formula One currently is. With these boxes at the time, there was no need for a cut on the upshift. They functioned much like the boxes on a V8 supercar or a BTCC car, straight up, straight down. But they would have a distinct drop in revs when they did change up. The efficiency wasn't there and the box would still take a decent amount of time for the gear to change, at least by these gearbox standards anyway. So teams were looking at ways of reducing that time down so that as little power on upshift was lost. Although it appears at the end of the 2005 season, one of the BAR engineers admitted that they had used a seamless shifting box during the course of that season, which led to Williams designing their own for 2006. So how does it work? Good question. It's exactly as it says on the tin, to be honest. There's no brief moment where the box is in neutral and it means that everything is just way more efficient in terms of power delivery. Unlike these more modern dual clutch gearboxes found on road cars, these F1 gearboxes are straight cut so you're still just slamming it into gear for want of a better phrase. Formula 1 cars only have one clutch that weighs barely a kilogram. I'm no engineer so talking about it in all the in-depth detail is going to waste all of our time and I'm not going to sit and pretend I know how it works. From what I gather is that they've got two shift drums, one for the odd gears and one for the even gears, so when you pull the paddle the next gear is always ready to go, no matter what, and you end up changing gear in somewhere between 2 to 4 milliseconds. Faster than you can blink, basically, I mean it takes what, about 0.4 of a second to blink, so 4 thousandths of a second to change gear. That's pretty quick, and I read somewhere that it's only a drop of about 600 RPM or so, so it's way more efficient than anything they'd had before. And when you've got the hybrids on tap as well, and the turbo in the modern cars, it's just going to be sheer power. So from aluminium gearboxes operated very similarly to how you drive a road car, assuming you have a manual, to these intricate, expensive, high-tech, precision-made, what other adjectives you want to use, operated from a single paddle that then uses solenoids, actuators and sensors to do all the work in well, a split second that the human brain just cannot do by itself, and then lasts for five races before you can change it, that's a lot of progress. I mean, I do drive a manual. It is fun, but there is something incredible about these flappy paddle sequentials. H pattern is fun, but flappy paddle is speed. And if you're going to tell a driver that this is the 2023 Red Bull, and this is also a 2023 Red Bull, but this one has an H pattern and this one has a flappy paddle, they're going to take the flappy paddle one every single time. But you never think about how they're put together and how much of a hammering they take. It would be interesting to see what would happen to one without all of these gizmos. It will probably eat itself alive. And if a driver still had to lift and blip, the car would probably lose control before it ate itself alive. But at the same time, it shows for even the bits that you don't really see on a Formula 1 car, how much design, R&D, money goes into every bit of a Formula 1 car. So then a look at the history of F1 gearbox construction and the exotic materials used and the reasons why they went that way. If this has given you food for thought or explained something you might never have thought of otherwise then do like this video so I know I did a good job and for more like this get subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the rad lads at Patreon for the support and if you want to help keep things running around here then you can help out by hitting up the link at the bottom of this video that will take you to the Patreon page or there's my affiliates down there too if you still need some F1 swag for 2024. There's also links to Discord and socials to connect that way and memberships and super thanks if that's more your thing. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are and goodbye. <laughs>